Well, guys, welcome to another session of Iron Sharpens Iron. As Iron Sharpens Iron, so one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. So no man walks alone. We have any new folks with us today? First timers? Wow. Fantastic. Fantastic. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Welcome. How'd you hear about us? Fantastic. Way to go. Fantastic. TCV. Oh. Well, welcome, guys. Uh, we're in for a treat today. And uh, before we do that, though, let me pray for us, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the subject. Father, we, we thank you uh, to live in a country where we can freely meet and worship you, Lord. Father, you didn't create us for isolation. You created us relationship and that's what this organization is all about Lord where men can be transparent they can mention their stuff without fear of being shamed or or judged and where we can sharpen one another to be better fathers better husbands and better leaders in our community so help us to settle our thoughts Lord I'd like your Holy Spirit to be active and present in Patrick as he presents today, and that we would all have a, a spirit of uh, discernment and uh, a desire to learn. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there's a subject. There's a subject that we address a couple times a year here at Iron Sharpens Iron, and it's one of those times where we're going to do that again. Um, our guest speaker is Patrick Schonbachler. A little background on Patrick. Uh, I met Patrick about a year ago, and uh, I met him through Mark Sims. Again, that's just evidence of how iron sharpens iron works, men coming together and helping one another. Since I've known Patrick, I've come to know him as an amazing, deep, deep friend and a true disciple of Christ. He's originally, Patrick, I may have this wrong, I think from Indiana. But he's been in the Phoenix Valley for the last six years. He has a master's degree in theology. He has a master's degree in divinity. He has a master's degree in counseling psychology. And he has a PhD in psychology. My guess is most of you never knew this, the no Patrick, because he's an incredibly humble man. Don't call him doctor. He is a doctor, but he doesn't like to be called that. So, why is he here? Well, obviously, he's highly qualified to speak to us about the negative spiritual, psychological, and physical aspects of porn addiction. If anybody's more qualified to talk to that subject, let me know, based on Patrick's education. But that's not why he's here today. Instead, Patrick will share a deeply personal story of addiction that took him farther than he ever wanted to go. It cost him more than he ever wanted to pay. And it's kept him longer than he ever wanted to stay. Guys, please listen carefully to what Patrick has to share with us today. Please welcome Patrick Sean Buckler. Good morning. Can you, can you hear me all right? Yep, yep. Okay, good. Um, this little talk is um, directed at grandfathers. Um, I know that several grandfathers in the room have um, children and grandchildren who are coming into a world that they really don't know how to handle and how to negotiate. And they struggle with um, sexual issues. It's a whole different world for your grandchildren, my grandchildren, and our children. The values that uh, we held growing up, that we were taught in um, church, that we were taught by our 
families are very different these days than they were 50 years ago. So, I'd like to address this to grandfathers and fathers and if there happens to be a millennial or two in the room, um, I live with two millennials. <laughs> so apparently uh, God has a sense of humor. Uh, so this is also kind of um, in the back door directed toward them as well. I want to read to you one of my favorite passages, um, one of the favorite stories I have from Jesus. It's in Mark, the first chapter. It's in the 40th verse. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. There was a man who laid in bed with his wife early in the morning. His eyes opened and he faced another day. He was a merchant, a tradesman. He had a fairly good business, a wife, two small children. And he woke up facing, getting ready to work another day went over to the basin of water that he had near his bed, rolled up his tunic, and started to dip his hands in the water, and he looked and he was shocked. There was a small white spot on his arm. He tried to push it out of his head, he washed his face, he changed tunics, he got ready for work, he went to work, went to his shop, opened his shop, and every once in a while he would pull up his tunic to look to see if the spot was still there. It did not go away. He went home that evening, had dinner with his wife, looked at his children. They played for a while. He went to bed, woke up the next morning. The spot was now bigger. In fact, now there were two spots. He washed his face washed his hands, said his prayers, went to work, opened his shop, did business like he always does, kept his tunic and his sleeve close to his wrist so no one would see. And occasionally through the day, he would look at that arm, and now the two spots were three. In Leviticus, he knew what he had to do, the prescription was pretty simple, pretty clear, pretty straightforward. He went to the priest. But before going to the priest, he went to see his family. He looked at his wife, told her that he loved her, held her for a while. She didn't quite understand. And then he held each of his children in his arms and held them close and felt his heart throb. And then he went to the priest. He showed the priest the now four marks on his arm and a new one on his other arm. The priest backed away three or four steps, looked at him, pointed a finger and said, Leper, you are forbidden to be in the city. You will go to the outskirts of the city where all the other lepers and outcasts are. You will remain there until either you die or until you are healed. So he left. Tears running down his face. He went to the outskirts of the city. He crawled down into a ravine and there he saw all sorts of other people with leprosy. Some faces torn away, some hands showing bones. And he knew his fate. And there he sat. His family brought him food when they could without a breadwinner 
it's very hard for a single mom and two children to find enough leftovers to take to the leper colony. But they did what they could. No one comes to visit. Even the lepers don't talk to each other. They're alone and isolated. Days turn to weeks, weeks to months, months to years. And he's dying, but he's dying slowly. Why did God do this to me? Why won't God heal me? I've said a thousand prayers. Why doesn't he just heal me like he did other people? And then one day, in his loneliness and being an outcast, he hears a name. That name is Jesus. Something in this man just starts to come alive. He has something he has not had in years. And that something is hope. His heart beats a little faster and he longs for more information and bits and pieces of information come to him and he discovers that Jesus is coming to his town. And now the man decides on a plan. It's a bold plan. It will probably cost him his life, but he has nothing else to lose. If a leper is found outside the leper colony, he's stoned to death immediately. There's no mercy. Leprosy was a disease no one wanted. It was incurable. So he waited and prayed. And he heard the commotion and the crowds and he saw a man and 11 other men around him walking toward the town. And he decided that he would make his move. He did. He picked himself up as best he could because the disease now had really gotten to his legs and his muscles and he was atrophying. And he ran as hard as he could. And as he came close to Jesus, and the disciples, the disciples dispersed. They just moved away. This is a leper. They didn't want to be touched. Only one went toward the leper. Only one looked at him and walked toward him. Only one. He fell down at this man's feet. And he looked up at Jesus and said, if you can heal me, if you're willing to heal me, please heal me. With tears in his eyes, he said, please heal me. And Jesus did what only Jesus could do. He bent down, he got on his knees with the leper, held his face in his hands and said, of course, be healed. And he was. Jesus took upon himself the leprosy that no one else would touch. I'll tell you why I like that story me. When I was a kid, I went through some things probably should have never happened. When I was a kid, I got beaten. And the beatings just went on. It went on week after week, and month after month. Sometimes I knew why, most of the time I didn't. She loved me, but I only figured that out much later. And the beatings just went on and they were senseless. And I was told that I was worthless. And I was told that I'd never amount to anything. And I was told that I'd always fail. And I'd never make it in life. Words have a way of becoming truth after a while. And I believed it. 
One day she picked up that same wooden spoon that she used again and again and again, and she was ready to hit me. And I was, I was 13 years old, and I realized I was bigger than she. And I looked at her, and with both hands, I pushed her against the wall. And I said, you will never hit me again. And I saw her face change and her hand drop. And I let her go and she walked away. That night when my father got home, I found my father confronting me. My father was a good man and he loved me. But he said, you will never touch your mother again and I found myself on the other side of the room, on the floor, aching in my backside. My father very seldom hit me, very seldom. Got in a lot of trouble when I was in high school, did a bunch of things I shouldn't have, probably why I get along with teenagers so well who are troubled, <laughs> so I know exactly what they go through. I know why they go through it. I know why they act out. It's not because they wake up one day and say, you know, I'm going to be a dirty little piece of crap. I'm going to cause everybody in my life as much damage as I can. I'm going to hurt as many people. I'm going to rob from them. I'm going to steal from them. I'm going to steal cars. I'm going to go into homes. I'm going to take a gun. I'm going to make sure I get what's due me. I know that because that's what I did. When I turned 18, I got accepted in a college, Tarkio College. You've never heard of it. Most people haven't. It's a school that's in the middle of a cornfield in Missouri. Nobody even knows where Missouri is. Oh, sorry. My apologies. We'll talk afterwards. I think there's healing for you. It was one of the few colleges I could get accepted at. Um, I applied to a bunch. I didn't really want to go to college. My dad was a mechanic, an auto mechanic, and that's what I intended to be. I think an auto mechanic is a great profession. But dad had other ideas, and so did mom. So I got accepted at Tarkio. That first day I was there, I was terrified. I was just frightened. Stayed a couple of days before we had our first assembly. I remember the dean of students all putting us in the chapel. And there we were, the freshman class, and we were in a room like this, much bigger. And he looked and he pointed his finger and he said, this half of the room will not be here in a semester. I was on that half of the room. Of course I'm going to be a failure. Of course I won't amount to anything. Of course I couldn't make it through college. Next couple of days, I went for walks. And in the quietness of my dorm room, just before my walk, I got down on my knees and said, if you're real, and if you help people like you say you do, I need your help. And I went for a walk. And I came back and I was a different guy. When I graduated high school, it was Proviso West, and there were 4,000 kids at Proviso West, and my graduating class was 1,100, and I graduated 994. At the end of my first year of college, they called me in and said, we're going to give you money to come back. Your grades are so good and you've done so well. God does miracles. God changes lives. But the wounds were still there. The wounds from my childhood 
the wounds that I could never seem to outrun, they were still there. I got married to a lovely woman, and we were married for uh, about 21 years. I had an affair on her when I was 40 years old, and I was a, an associate pastor in a large church. I had an affair with the choir director. She was as broken as I was. And God tried to get me into counseling, and God tried to reconcile my marriage, and God spoke to me in whispers, and at sometimes he spoke to me in shouts. But I wouldn't listen. And my marriage ended in divorce with two beautiful little girls. I don't know why, but God opened the door for me to go to graduate school and become a psychologist at Wheaton College. I didn't think that I'd get into Wheaton because I was divorced. But he opened the door. It was the first doctoral program that they had and the first doctoral candidates that they'd ever um, chosen. And I was in the first graduating class. It's quite an honor. But I failed. I failed God. I failed my marriage. I betrayed my vows. All because of the wound inside of me. The affair lasted about 14 months. We were married. I couldn't live with her for more than 14 months and I left. And I stayed alone for about 12 years. The very thing Satan wanted me to do is to isolate and stay alone, and I did. I had several apartments, and then I finally bought a house, a condo, and I was alone. And the loneliness and the isolation started to work on me. But you know, there's this wonderful thing called the internet. It's a great invention. It has incredible amount of knowledge and resources. It also has pornography. And I discovered porn. And I discovered guilt. And I'd already known what shame was. So for 12 years, 12 long, very lonely years, I spent soothing myself, comforting myself in front of a screen of pornography and hating myself and swearing to God over and over and over again, I will not do this again, I will not do it again, I will not do it again. And I was a leper. I was a leper. Moved to Arizona about six years ago. And about year three, I ended up at uh, ISI. This very group. And my wife found out about my addiction, yelled and screamed at me as she should. And I failed again. But you know, oh God, he just has different ideas, doesn't he? He just has different ideas. He doesn't seem to want to give up on anybody. He doesn't give up on anybody. Every time I walk through those doors, there are three men who come and greet me. There are three men who sit with me, this old leper who has failed over and over and over again. Three men is all God needed.
David Ted and Skip knew who I was and knew what I'd done. They never gave up on me. God never gave up on me. When I first met Skip, I looked at him and I thought, he told me about the program he had and I thought, why not, I'll give it a try. Everything else has failed. Everything. I've been sober for 11 months now, looking hard at 12. God doesn't give up on anyone. Jesus has an amazing verse, or there's an amazing verse about what Jesus said in John chapter 6. It says this, The Father brings to me all who he will, and anyone who comes to me, I will never cast out. Never. I will never cast out. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the secrets that you hold in your heart. I have some really dark secrets. Watching porn for all these years does that to a heart. I have some things that I've thought about that I dare not even whisper. The trouble with porn is that you never get enough. You always have to have more. It just pulls you in. Satan puts a noose around your throat and he will not let it go. He intended to kill me, just like he intends to kill everybody in this room. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. So now you've heard my story. Surprised some of you are still sitting. I thought some of you would leave by now. Because I'm a leper, you see. But I'm a leper that Jesus has his hands on my face. And he looks at me in love. Okay, so, I'm a psychologist as well as a lever. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about addiction, about the, what happens to the brain when it changes over the course of, a, of an addiction. Um, the brain produces a wonderful neurotransmitter called dopamine. It's... Um, we're discovering a lot about the brain, and so all of this is emerging science. Um, what I've discovered about science is that it's, um, it follows after the sound and the voice of God. God put the stars and the heavens and the earth in motion. He put all of us, created all of us. There's not a person in here that God did not form. Read Psalm 139. And science follows that. Most scientists don't know that and they don't say that, but that's what science does. We discover things that God has done. So God has given us this wonderful neurochemical called dopamine in an incredible organ called the brain. The brain is a, a, probably the most complex um, organ in the whole cosmos because it was created by God. And it's because of the brain that we bear the image of God. We also bear the image of God in our spirits. We were made to love God and to worship God, but most folks don't see it that way. I do. You're here because you do too. When the brain gets stimulated, dopamine is released. You can get stimulated by um, walking into Skip's um, house and having steak cooking on the grill. It just releases wonderful dopamine. You can get um, dopamine um, rush when you watch a son's game 
especially now that they're in the playoffs. It's about time. You can get dopamine when um, your wife brushes um, next to you in the kitchen and you look at her with that look that you and he, she know. And there's going to be a tender moment. Dopamine is a wonderful chemical. It goes to the opioids, uh, opioids uh, uh, receptors. And I know that in our culture, opioids are kind of a bad word, but they're really a good neurotransmitter. They're what um, give you pleasure. The problem is, is that when dopamine is um, stimulated, and you get a release of um, opioids, and the receptors all light up. You can see it in FRM's uh, uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. You can see the brain just kind of light up when it gets uh, stimulated. It's really kind of a, an interesting thing. It's a fun thing to do. It's a fun thing to watch. It's not to go through when, never mind. At any rate, um, when the circuits get stimulated and they get stimulated by dopamine, they need more. So um, we like food, and the nice thing about food is that there's a variety. It's all new, you know. It's I mean, when you had steak this week, it's not the same steak you're going to have next month. It's different. I remember Thanksgiving, turkey, all those wonderful smells. You not only get the smells, but you get the wonderful uh, sensation of having family and friends around. And then you probably, you may have a drink or two. And that adds to the comfort and to the stimulation. And dopamine is flowing and you're having a great time. But it's not the great time that you'll have next Thanksgiving. And the dopamine craves for that. Because you know that when next Thanksgiving comes, you know all the wonderful things that are going to happen. And so you start getting excited, the brain starts getting excited. When you look at porn, when you have alcohol, when you have too much whiskey, and you do it again and again and again, the problem is, is that the dopamine levels go down. So you gotta have more in order to get the same kick. You do that long enough, and it becomes a habit. Habits can be either good or they can be very destructive. Addiction is a destructive habit. The brain then craves dopamine for porn, for alcohol, for a number of things, gambling, and it will continue to crave it until it gets satisfied. This part of your brain called the frontal lobes, this is the prefrontal cortex, it's where we do our thinking, it's where we have our judgments, it was, it's the place where we have values, it's the place where we um, do memory and we organize. All of this is up here. It's kind of what separates us from everything else in creation. By the way, we did not um, emerge from the monkeys. Okay, so I just want to put that out there. Um, evolution has too many holes. And I know I'm kind of a lone voice in that. There aren't many of us who say that. But evolution has too many holes. It's what's called Darwin's black box. You have this, you have this change, this change, this change, and then you have this change way over here. And how do we get from here to here? Darwin's black box. We don't know what's in the box. We just know that there's a box there and that it should progress, but we don't know how or why. Well, that's a hole. So, where was I going with this? I know where I was going with this. Um, addiction develops habits, and the habits can be either good or bad. When the habits are developing, and they're bad habits, um, they're virtually, um, they're very difficult to stop. That's what makes pornography so difficult. Now, in our culture, there's been a shift. When I was growing up as a boy, porn was, um, I found that at the drugstore, and I used to slip it into a newspaper and pay for the newspaper and steal it and walk out the, walk out the uh, drugstore uh, front door. When porn got a little more um, widespread, people used to get it in the mail in brown paper bags. 
or brown wrapping. The difficulty is now that uh, we have the internet. Porn is accessible to anybody, 24-7, any place, anywhere you want to go. We don't have to sneak around to movie theaters and drive around the block, make sure that nobody's there. And when you go into the movie theater, you hope and pray that the place doesn't catch on fire because, oh my gosh, what if the neighbors found out where I was? What if God knew? God knows. Nowadays, that's not the case. Kids that are 13 to 24 72% of them look at porn on a regular basis. 72%. Porn has become mainstream for our children. Adults 25 and older, a little over 50% of us look at porn, at least occasionally. It's now mainstream. And porn is no longer just nudity. Porn is violent. Porn is degrading. Porn will um, uh, objectify human beings so that they're no longer real people. They're things that we look at for our own pleasure. The porn images become whatever we want them to become. That's what makes this addiction so hard to kick and you won't kick it alone. Now, if it's mainstream, it's mainstream because there's a kind of new morality in our culture. The new morality is all about this. We are a culture that says, I need to reach my highest potential. I need to reach for the stars. And I need to become all that I can become. Remember those commercials? I mean, turn on the NFL, watch an NBA game, um, look at the, an NBL game. Um, you become all that you can be. Stars galore. Well, in order to become all that I can be, I have to actualize who I am. How do I do that? Well, in any way that I can develop myself and express myself and reach my fulfillment, that's what I'm going to do. I then become the authority and the moral center for my behavior. And anything I want to do is fine as long as it doesn't um, invade society, as long as it doesn't become destructive to society. I'm my own moral, uh, my own moral uh, standard. And if that's the case, then ethics values all depend on me. The Judeo-Christian uh, tradition says that ethics are based on love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. It's exactly opposite of what we have in the culture. Porn thrives and it's become mainstream because there's a new morality, and the morality says, whatever pleases me and whatever develops me, whatever I can gain to, I can, I can use in order to um, satisfy and develop my potential, that's what I can do. The Bible says, God first and my neighbor as myself. Okay? Now, If that's the situation we find ourselves in, what's the big deal? If porn is mainstream and our children are accepting it and they talk to each other Sorry. I turned that on, Danny. Sorry. Can you turn it down? Thanks. Excuse me. Yeah. So Okay, so, all right. 
if our children are talking to their friends about it, and the assumption is that our children um, and their friends are just used to porn, it's become mainstream, what's the big deal? I mean, the advocates of porn say that porn will enhance your sex life. So in surveys that I've read in an, um, uh, a, uh, a survey by Barna, uh, who, that was also sponsored by um, Josh McDowell Ministries, um, they looked at 3,000 people and asked the question, what do you think about porn? And they asked it in a variety of ways. Porn is mainstream now. Our grandchildren will grow up talking to their friends who are using porn. Our children are growing up and they have friends, married friends, who use porn regularly to get stimulated in the bedroom. It's mainstream. It's all around us. You can't turn on a computer without running across some image of sexuality and some of it is porn. So what's the big deal? I don't have to answer that question. I have skipped to do that. Porn supports a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, let me share some scripture with you. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea, Matthew 18, 6. Do you guys have any idea how many uh, innocent young girls are forced into this porn industry? And anybody that watches that on, on, uh, on the screen and acts out to it, in my view, is guilty of that. And I'm not sure about you, but I don't want to have a millstone around my neck. Uh, a lot of people think that getting married is going to cure their addiction to porn. First of all, they don't believe they have an addiction. They think they can stop whenever they want to. They cannot. I will bet my life on that. They can't stop on their own. So what happens is they get married and everything is great for a month or two. They don't look at porn. They enjoy the, the intimacy with their wife. Virtually 100% of those men will be back using porn within four to six months regularly. What this does is two things. Guys that are so used to using porn um, find that uh, they need more and more and more and darker and darker and darker images and videos to continue that same dopamine high. When they start having intimacy with their wife the way God created it, they get used to their wife's body, they get used to the way they make love, and within a couple, two, three, four, five, six months, they start having erectile dysfunction problems. They can't get uh, sexually stimulated by their wives because they've just flooded their brain with all this need for new and new and new and novel and novel and different and different. And so the uh, Viagra industry has exploded, but not with the guys my age anymore. It's with millennials that can't get an erection because they've overstimulated their brains and therefore their wives feel there's something wrong with them. And ultimately what the guy has done is he's married a beautiful daughter of God and he's betrayed her in the worst possible way. Why any young man, or any man for that matter, would choose to marry a woman knowing that he's got this problem, I have no idea. There's help, and there, but you have to be willing to get help. But I tell guys that I work with, I don't want you to even think about dating a woman until you've been sober for 12 months. It is not fair to her. This disease will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, cost you more than you ever wanted to pay, and keep you much longer than you ever wanted to stay. Also, there's a lot of men in the church that are very um, well known uh, throughout Christian circles, the latest one being Ravi Zacharias, who have secrets that are not dealing with this issue. And when it comes out, this addiction will spiritually castrate men and it renders their lifelong testimony of their Christian walk completely irrelevant and causes people to walk away from the faith. Guys, porn addicts lie. They lie to themselves and they lie to others. People say, well, I'm just gonna get into an accountability group with men and, and we'll deal with this. Doesn't work, doesn't work. Addicts lie. 
I was in men's accountability groups for years. Many of you know my story. I was addicted to porn for 50 years. Get in a group of guys. How you doing this week? I'm doing okay. You sure? Yeah, I'm doing great. Okay. Did you lie to me today? No. Yes, I did. But men's accountability groups for this addiction are useless. Now get into a true uh, pure desire accountability group with men like the ones that I run that last a year. That's a different story. Staten's greatest tools in this area are shame and isolation. If he can keep you isolated and full of shame over your, your addiction, he's got you right where he wants you and you're never going to work your way out of it. The only way to deal with this is to get into a group of men that are, that are struggling with this in a program that is God-centered. And fortunately, um, I found one of those programs. God delivered me from this addiction. My son is sitting over here. I almost lost my son. I almost lost my marriage. I almost lost my life to this addiction. And what God has done in my life is nothing short of a miracle. I've been completely sober and abstinent from any type of porn addiction for over five years now. So I know it's possible. So, what are the next steps? What are we going to do about this as guys? First of all, if this is something you're personally dealing with, let me know. Get hold of me privately. I promise you it'll be total confidence and we'll talk about what you can do. But the first thing is to do is to take this sexual addiction uh, screening test. And I can point you to it. It's online. It's completely anonymous. And you'll be able to determine very quickly if you really have an addiction to this issue. Secondly is you can get involved in a peer desire accountability group which is what I lead, and we can talk about that. But lastly, let me leave you with this, and then we can open it up for questions. I want to see a hand of those of you who bel truly believe this is a major issue, and as a church and as men, we need to attack this head on. Okay, so virtually everybody's raising their hand. So here's my question. What can you do personally? Maybe you're not dealing with this, but it's a good chance either your son or your wife's husband, or your grandchildren are dealing with this. And as fathers and grandfathers, we have to take a stand. So uh, what I recommend as a first step is to get a program called Covenant Eyes on every single device that you own, that your wife owns, anybody that lives under your roof owns, even if it's an adult child, if they live under your roof make it a requirement. Everybody in this house, as for me and my family, as for me and my house, we stand for the Lord. We put covenant eyes on our phones, covenant eyes, and then you have an accountability partner, and there's nothing you look at that your accountability partner won't see. And he'll actually see the screen images of what you looked at. It's a huge deterrent that gives you time to process what you're about to do and to, and to not do it. Um, if you've got children living in your home, it's not enough to say, I'm putting all this on your phones. Because that's, don't do as I do, do as I say. That doesn't work. It's, hey, as for me and my house, guys, this is on my phone. My wife has it on her phone, on every computer in this house. And by the way, children, every one of you is going to have this on your device now, and we're going to serve the Lord. There's lots of help out there, but this is an addiction that you will never, never overcome on your own. You cannot pray your way out of this. Okay, with that, I'll turn it back to Patrick and maybe... Uh, let you guys ask some questions if you have any. Do you have Do you have questions you want to ask? Um, I struggled this. I struggled with this for thirty years, off and on for thirty years, and you won't do it alone. You have to have people around you. That's why ISI was so important for me. I have two other groups that I go to, and then I told you about my closest friends here. So you won't do it alone. But maybe you have questions. Way in the back. David. Yeah, um, I'm just curious. Um, you have been through um, a lot of education, and some of it in divinity. Right. And so I would just like to know from you, Patrick, um, on a spiritual basis, where or how Jesus became uh, the effective healer in your life versus the education. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about the education is this. There's uh, several studies that um, note that the more education you have, the more vulnerable you are to addictions. 
Um, that includes alcohol, gambling, and in my case, porn. And they don't know why, nobody knows why. We just are more open, more vulnerable to it. Um, as far as the education, God blessed me with just um, wonderful opportunities to be educated, but education alone will not, um, doesn't save your soul. You need other people around you who will support you, who will um, speak truth into your life, um, and who have the tenderness that um, comes from Jesus to accept you for who you are. The leper that was in me was accepted, and that was, that's what brought healing. There's a scripture, I don't know specifically, um, you guys probably know where it's from in the New Testament, but it says, um, no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Scientists have now done imaging of the brain, and they did a study where they took a porn addict, a heroin addict, and an alcoholic, all that were active in their addiction, and imaged their brains, and then did images of, of a normal, quote unquote, non-addict's brain. And every one of the addicts had the same scalloping, low blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, all had the same imaging. What that's saying is that porn is a full, can be, and is usually a full-blown addiction. Okay, but the program I take guys through is not a 12-step program. What I take them through is a Christian-based, Christ-centered program that helps them understand how to renew their mind. It's a process, and it takes quite a while. And the guys that I'm working with are, are deeply involved in it, and I'm seeing a lot of success. But this whole, everything is Christ-centered, and it's right there in the Bible. It's just we need to understand the context. Patrick, you started out by saying this is a message for grandfathers. Yep. Now, I understand as a father with children in your home, there are things you can do. Skip's talked about those. But what can we do as a grandfather with children and grandchildren who are living somewhere else with their parents, another city, how, how can we be uh, an influence in their lives when they're distant? Um, one of the difficulties with pornography is, or one of the major problems with pornography is that it isolates. And people don't have a place that's safe to talk to. Guess what grandparents are? Grandparents are safe. Start a conversation with your grandchildren. And they will, um, they'll be happy to have a place to land that's safe. Lectures don't work. They never have. Shaming is the absolute last, that you never want to shame. But a safe place with a grandparent who can um, love and understand and support this is also a disease that does not um, get resolved quickly or easily. Um, the brain changes, but it changes slowly. Um, before new, new neural pathways are made, you're looking at anywhere from two to five years for change to actually take place. Well, you have the chance to shape your grandchildren. There are only 7% of churches in the country that have a program for um, people who are addicted to porn, 7%. Churches don't want to deal with this. What they do is that um, people are afraid to talk to their pastors because they're afraid they'll get a lecture. They're afraid to go to reveal themselves to the churches itself uh, as a whole because they're afraid of the shame that will come. And people don't know how to deal with us. They don't know how to deal with addicts. So we flounder and we're lost. Don't let that happen. You all in this room are change agents. You have an incredible amount of influence within the church. Make the church a place that Jesus always intended, that God always intended the church to be, and that is a, a place for sinners, for addicts, for those of us who fail, for all of us lepers. Make the church that. 
It is what Jesus came for, and it's what he died for. Mark, to your point also, if I can just add to what Patrick said, um, perhaps one way is to be talking to your son on the phone or your son-in-law and just say, I've been reading a lot of statistics lately, and this scares me to death for my grandchildren because I see that how accessible this is, how it leads to a full-blown addiction. I am just, I just want to know what I can do to help you, help your, my grandchildren, your children to not fall into this. I've read there's a lot of resources available. Have, have you and Sherry, I'm just using a name, you and your wife talked about how, you, how you're handling this and is there something I can do to, to help, you know, sure like to nip this one in the bud with our, you know, that kind of thing. So you're not saying, hey, do you have this problem to your son? You're talking more about your grandchildren, but could be very convicting to him as well. Just one idea. First thing I like to say is that if I was going to talk to my son, I'd say, how are you going to prevent this? Because you know it's much more available than when I was around, when I was young, and, and it's much more than when you were younger. So you, how are you going to, I'm going to ask him the question, how are you going to prevent this from your kids? So you mentioned a, a program, software program that would probably put on the thing. So we can suggest that. Now, one of the, my question really is, you said that, well, I'm just going to say addictions. I, I quit smoking because God took it away from me. And that was an addiction that I had. I used to gamble a lot when I was younger, and I don't have any desire to do that anymore. So why is it that God can't help somebody with pornography? Can I take this, Patrick? Yeah. That's a great, a great question. Um, and I know he can. And, and, and David over here is, is an example where he's done that. Okay? I've been working with men for five years now, a lot of men. And I've been involved with councils of men who are, who are leaders in this area. And I've gone to seminars, uh, Christian seminars. Um, one, of the, one of the things they've discovered about porn addiction, they've, they've actually statistically, this is fact, of all the known addictions, it's the hardest to break. I've had guys that were alcoholics that said kicking alcoholism that I had for 20 years was a walk in the park compared to porn. You don't have to go buy a bottle. You don't have to go buy drugs. It all exists right up here and right here on your phone. Um, the draw is so incredibly powerful. Can God heal a person? Yes. Have I ever seen it happen in the literally hundreds of men I've worked with and talked with? Only once. And he's sitting right there. Only once. Okay? All right. Well, I, God bless you. That's not the way it works for most men. I did. It's experience. Guys that are sold out to the Lord. Guys, when I, and, I, and my son is here, so I've got to be careful how I frame this. John knows about my addiction, but I don't, he doesn't want to know the details, and probably good that I don't share them. But I can tell you one thing. After 50 years of this addiction, there, probably the last 20 years of it, there wasn't a time after I acted out that I didn't cry out to God on my hands and knees, begging, begging God to forgive me, and promising God, promising him I would never, ever, ever do this again. And I made that promise hundreds and hundreds of times. Okay. So if I can just add to that, um, what brought me healing was community. Sin doesn't live very well in Christian community when the community is open, transparent, and accepting. Sin doesn't live very well in a community that is full of grace and truth. So create an atmosphere, create um, moments of grace and acceptance within your family. Um, people don't have a place to go. Kids don't have a place to go to talk about this. They want to, but they don't have a place that they really trust. So if you can create times and moments of acceptance and trust, of openness and transparency, um, kids respond to that. Okay. Guys, I'm gonna have, we're going to have to close now. Sure.
Eye Center, Scriptural Center process. God, uh, God is using Patrick, God is using me and using others that had to do this the hard way to help other Christian men recover from this. If God just snapped his fingers and killed everybody that way, um, that wouldn't, well, I'll just leave it there. That's not the way it normally happens. Guys, let's thank Patrick. Let's thank Skip for today. <clears throat> a tough subject, but a subject that has to be talked about and has to be talked about often. Maybe you don't have the problem, but you definitely know somebody that does. So if iron sharpens iron, we have to do our job and get those people help. And we've talked a lot today about how to do that. Have them see Patrick, have them see Skip, have them see one of us so we can point them in the right direction to healing. Who's a leper in here? Absolutely. So you get my point. Iron sharpens iron. We appreciate you all coming today. Let's close in prayer. Lord, that you would bless us indeed with abundance today, that you enlarge our territory, Lord, to serve you more. Cover us, Father, with your arm and keep us from harm and evil, that we may cause or experience no pain. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for our speakers today. Thank you for our volunteers. Thank you for all our new men. Thank you for Discovery Point uh, hosting us today. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Feel free to stick around, guys. Thank you for today. Next week is we're going to talk about volunteering and serving. We have a great panel we're going to have next week. So we look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.